Hi everyone, it's time for an update for the Rhode Island DOT Washington Bridge project, that ongoing saga. There's been a lot of recent new developments. I've also commissioned my own drone flight. That was done on Monday, September 28th. Now the last update that I did talked about the fact that Rhode Island DOT received no bids for the design and construction of the replacement westbound Washington Bridge. The only contract that was issued, it was a separate RFP, was for demolition of the westbound bridge, and that went to Aetna Bridge, and they finally got started in September, and then after about less than two weeks, they were ordered to stop their demolition activity because lawyers associated with this lawsuit filed on behalf of the state of Rhode Island decided that they needed to, quote, preserve evidence to support their claims that either there was some negligence or other activity that contributed to the sudden closure of the Washington Bridge. In this case, and as I mentioned in previous videos, the state of Rhode Island and Rhode Island DOT has prioritized pursuing these lawsuits over replacing this bridge. I mean, given the importance of this bridge, you would think they would just simply prioritize getting this thing uh, replaced as soon as possible. But they want their cake and eat it too, but Obviously, they, again, they've prioritized the lawsuit. So let's look at some of this drone footage. The equipment was left as is. This has been like this for about the last two weeks, just no demolition activity. I suppose they've left it in a safe condition here. Now, I mentioned a couple of news articles. I'll have links to these in the description. This is from the Brown Daily Herald. Again, talks about Washington Bridge demolition paused due to government lawsuit. And that demolition was paused on September 17th. And I'll read this from this article. The engineers for RIDOT, in cooperation with the state's legal team, have reached the point in the demolition of the Washington Bridge where work must be paused to preserve evidence for the legal case, the statement reads. While the announcement gave no timeline for when demolition would resume, it expressed the goal of eventually continuing demolition as swiftly as possible while ensuring important evidence is preserved. And there's a WPRI article that was recently issued. Again, another link to this in the description. And uh, I'm recording this video on Friday, October 4th. The Rhode Island DOT director, Peter Alviti, has said that their plan was to reissue the request for proposal uh, perhaps uh, later today, but uh, in a recent interview, he didn't confirm that that would be the case. You know, their initial RFP got no response. Then they issued a request for information, and apparently 11 firms responded and basically explained why nobody in their right mind would have uh, taken a bite at that first request for proposal for the design and construction of the westbound bridge. And uh, Rhode Island DOT has refused to make that information publicly available, which I think is quite odd. They could certainly redact any proprietary information, but, uh, you know, I guess they could even defer to the people that provided that information to the extent that they wanted that to remain confidential. But I suspect that many of these companies would have no problem with their advice being made public. Now, one thing in this WPRI article, they mentioned that in order to reconfigure the request for proposal for the design and construction of the new westbound bridge, they have now decided that reuse of the existing foundation would not occur, which is prudent. It's something they should have realized with the initial RFP. In fact, I pointed this out in previous videos that it would take way too much time. It's really not that reliable to determine the adequacy of a foundation that's been in place for over 50 years for reuse for presumably another roughly 75 years. So they didn't recognize that at the time, they do now. Part of that thinking, I guess, came out of this consultant's report issued in February as a result of their forensic investigation of the westbound Washington Bridge. And they talk about doing things that could permit reuse of the Bridge Foundation, which again, I've been involved with testing new foundations for a few thousand bridges that were constructed. Most of these were replacement bridges, and I can't think of a single time when existing foundations were reused. It's just not done. There's a whole host of issues, 
And given how litigious Rhode Island DOT is, who in their right mind would take the risk of reusing anything from the uh, previous bridge? All right, let's roll some more footage from that drone flight that I had done on Monday. You can see mostly what they've done is stripped the deck off the bridge. They've taken out portions of some spans here. Looks like that might be near uh, Pier 2. Pier 6 and 7 is where they discovered the broken cantilever sections, the, the broken anchor rods. So as a reminder, here's all the companies that were named in the lawsuit. So these firms were involved with either the design and construction of rehabilitation phases for the westbound Washington Bridge, and then the others were involved with conducting inspections of the bridge over the years. Now it turns out the state of Rhode Island has a bridge inspection manual that was last updated July 2016. And I found some pretty interesting things there because essentially Rhode Island DOT is alleging that these consultants didn't do their job, that they apparently missed obvious things or didn't look at things that were critical to the performance and continued use of the bridge. That's, that's the allegation. So I, I wanted to go through this bridge inspection manual to see if there's anything extraordinary that would be required by Rhode Island DOT that would be a very high bar for anybody to achieve or just exactly what is required for these inspections. Interestingly, this manual, this bridge inspection manual was compiled by Rhode Island DOT and Michael Baker Incorporated and Michael Baker is one of the defendants in this lawsuit. And they also give special thanks to AECOM AI Engineers Inc., College Engineers Inc., Trans Systems, and WSP. So of these, AECOM's named in the lawsuit, Collins Engineers is named in the lawsuit, as is Trans Systems. Now you might ask yourself, does Rhode Island DOT have an arrangement where the consultant is completely responsible for these inspections? And the answer is no. Rhode Island DOT has their own bridge inspection division, and they also delineate what the DOT's responsibilities are relative to the responsibilities of their consultant. Now I'm just gonna read this. Now the duties of the program manager for Rhode Island DOT are described as follows. The program manager is the individual in charge of the bridge inspection program who provides overall leadership within the bridge inspection program and provides guidance to bridge inspection team leaders when requested. At a minimum, one statewide program manager is required by the FHWA. Now let's go down here to the responsibilities. The statewide program manager is assigned the duties and responsibilities for bridge inspection, reporting, and inventory. These duties and responsibilities may then be delegated by the statewide program manager to project managers, consultants, and team leaders within the state. Although the statewide program manager may choose to delegate some or all functions to other bridge inspection personnel, the statewide program manager retains all responsibility for bridge inspection operations for which he or she was assigned. So stop the presses. How is it if they're ultimately responsible at the DOT for performing these inspections, ensuring the accuracy of the inspections, that they can just go out and sue so many of these firms that have been involved with uh, annual bridge inspections of this project for, for many years now? and apparently alleging that they didn't do their job properly. Now let's talk about the scope of these inspections. And this again is out of the manual. A routine inspection is a documented investigation of the bridge that serves to compare the current condition with the previously documented condition. Although the information contained within the structure, inventory, and appraisal data should be mostly up to date, minor changes and or corrections to the data may be required based on current field observations and measurements. The routine inspection should be comprehensive such that a load rating analysis, if required, can be performed with existing information and the information collected in the field. If the bridge condition worsens and the structural adequacy compromised, it should be documented during the inspection using the bridge load rating and posting recommendations. So keep in mind, for the last many years, the bridge inspection reports have documented poor condition for the Washington Bridge, for the westbound bridge. And another term used for poor condition is structurally deficient. And this goes on to describe what special inspections are for the bridge. 
Now the frequency of these special inspections ranges from three to 12 months. Based on my understanding, they were doing these at a 12 month interval. And this section talks about that these bridge inspections are assigned to the consultant approximately three to six months prior to their due dates. So basically they're given three to six months to do these inspections and write the report and issue it to the Rhode Island DOT. It says in some cases a routine inspection may also warrant an in-depth inspection for problematic areas shall be performed during the routine inspection. Problematic areas shall include critical or non-critical areas of the bridge that can pose safety or structural capacity issues. Now the scope of a routine inspection includes inspection of the structure from the deck, walkways, structure platforms, access equipment as applicable to reach within 15 feet of all portions of the structure and ground and or water level. So the following are examples of areas or elements that may have an increased difficulty in obtaining access but warrant a close-up hands-on inspection. So low carrying members or areas of members in poor condition, fracture critical members or problematic details in fair or lesser condition, critical sections of controlling members on posted bridges. So I think that's going to be, again, a, a bone of contention in this lawsuit here is should these consultants have looked closer at these areas, for example, where the broken anchor rods were in these previous inspections and discovered the damage. You know, despite what Director Alviti tried to assert in December 2023 when it was discovered that this anchor rod had been broken, he trotted out photos saying, hey, in the July 2023 inspection, by the way, that was performed by AECOM, the rod wasn't broken. Well, if you look at photos of the rod, it's highly corroded. It's no doubt been broken for a very long time. So again, Rhode Island DOT's manager for their inspection department is ultimately responsible for the performance, the accuracy, reliability of these inspections according to their own manual. Now in this uh, VN report from February of this year, 2024, where they talk about the results of their forensic investigation, they mention that the geometry and detailing of the Washington Bridge does not allow for the complete assessment of post-tension systems. And that's one of the things they found to be in very poor condition. Now this is one of the interesting things about having a YouTube channel of this nature. I get contacted by a variety of people with very interesting thoughts and information. In this case, I received an email. Now keep in mind that the design and the construction of this bridge was completed in the 1960s. That, that is for the existing westbound bridge. And I received an email from a Mr. Laszlo Zygmunt who indicated he's with McGuire Associates and was on the design team for this bridge back in the 1960s. So I'm just going to read this here. Mr. Jones, if you see similarities between the Raphael Erdnetta Bridge and the Washington Bridge in Rhode Island, feel free to mention it in your video. You may also name me as the source of the information and perhaps reconsider your negative comment about the singularity of the structure. The Washington Bridge was not a duplication of the Erdnetta Bridge. It simply used some elements of that bridge, much celebrated at the time of its construction. In my initial concept, the cantilevers were large precast pre-stressed triangles supporting the drop-in spans. There were no fake arches. The difference between the old and the new was accentuated. Unfortunately, the force of tradition prevailed, the triangles morphed into the cantilevers, and everything got hidden by arch-looking curtain walls. I cannot find the original illustration in the drawer of the, at the DOT that holds the plans for the bridge. Perhaps it is still in the archives of McGuire. Innovation was always an important element in engineering, and I am thankful for the opportunity I had to come up with something different. I am certain that if the DOT took better care of the bridge, it would continue to serve the motoring public for many more years. Best regards, Laszlo. So again, I wasn't personally being critical of the design. I was pointing out what had been mentioned in that VN report in terms of the uniqueness of the design and the difficulty of accessing certain areas for inspection. But Thank you for reaching out to me. I think that's extremely interesting and I hope all of you enjoy the details that were provided there. So this is the Rafael Erdnetta Bridge in Venezuela. It connects across the strait to the north of Lake Maracaibo. And this is a Wikipedia entry. And I think what was unique about this bridge or, or, or what was being referenced relative to the Washington Bridge was the nature of the pre-stressed concrete 
and some of the other details that uh, Mr. Zygman mentioned. And that bridge construction was started in 1958 and ended in 1962. Keep in mind, post-tension concrete elements for bridge construction weren't really used until the late 1950s. And this was a time when engineers did designs using slide rules. And I pointed this out in a previous video by the Harbor Bridge in Corpus Christi. That was, I think, one of the first uses of post-tension concrete in the United States, if not, not the world. And uh, that bridge lasted a very, very long time and now it's currently being replaced. So we'll see where this all leads. Right now, Rhode Island DOT has issued a grant request and they're looking for 60% funding for total project cost estimated to be $368 million. And we know that number is going to go way above that figure, just given all the delays and complexities and liti the litigious environment that exists dealing with projects for Rhode Island DOT in the state of Rhode Island. But this grant was referenced as a MPDG grant, which stands for Multimodal Project Discretionary Grant, provides federal financial assistance to highway and bridge projects and so on. So I wonder how forthcoming federal funds are going to be considering the fact that the U.S. Department of Justice has initiated several months ago a fraud investigation into this project administered by Rhode Island DOT. And the period of their documents request basically encompasses the full period of time during which Alvedi has been their director. I don't know what's going to come of that. that. There's been no news about this fraud investigation since the initial announcement, as far as I could tell. Well, that and then they extended the period of time for discovery or for submission of these documents, and that's long since passed. So let's look at a little more of this drone footage. To me, it's extremely interesting that they paused construction after removal of this span. So it makes me wonder, was there something exposed that people said, hey, we need to stop because this is a smoking gun, as it were, in their opinion. Or it's just a coincidence that their legal group decided to stop demolition and it was independent of anything being discovered in the field. I, I simply don't know. Now we're coming ac across the area for Pier 6 and 7 where the steel anchor rods were discovered to be broken back in December of 2023, which led to the emergency shutdown of the Washington Bridge. But they were just getting into the demolition in earnest. I mean, they had just removed the paving for the deck, and a couple of the spans. Now it's gonna be interesting too, if Aetna Bridge is directed to resume their demolition, are they going to be directed to have a change order for demolition of the, the pile caps and perhaps removal of the existing pile? That isn't at all clear at this point. So again, we're flying over the area here. A lot of people were complaining about the noise because this work was being done at night. So again, I'm very pleased with this footage. Let me know what you think if you enjoy having this drone footage as part of my periodic updates on these various video topics that I've been following. So I'll continue to follow this story. I want to send out a shout out to the channel members. I really appreciate your ongoing support. Channel members get to preview my regular videos in advance of them being made public. I also want to send a shout out to those of you who have provided super thanks. That's another great way to support the channel. Thanks very much, everyone, and please stay tuned for future videos. I'm going to roll the credits here at the end of the video for the members and the super thanks folks.